Welcome to the Awesome Dynamic Show. This is Paul DeWarian, president of Awesome Dynamic. You'll notice that Terry, who usually runs the Awesome Dynamic Show, Terry Levin, our director of sales, is not with us today. He's going to be popping in after he finishes closing some deals, just what he should be doing. So I'm very happy that he's working on that. But he will be coming back with me today. I also have Robin, as usual. Robin, do you want to say hello? Hello. We got She's uh, in, in Highland Park. Uh, at a different location than she normally is, but she is joining us. We also have Blake from Florida. Say hello, Blake. Hola. All right, and we also have my brother Tim DeWarian, who is joining us for the second half. Where we're going to be talking about some specific items pertaining to labeling products for Amazon FBA. But before we get into that, we're going to get right into our advertised topic today of the big time dangers of black hat SEO. And we're going to get right into that topic right now. So, Robin, do you want to lead off? Sure. Um, so, as a business owner, you definitely want to be aware of Black Hat SEO. Uh, so, what is Black Hat SEO? Uh, well, White Hat is when you, you hire an SEO company and a reputable one will only do the SEO techniques that match in with uh, Google's guidelines and search engine guidelines. Uh, so, for White Hat SEO, that's what you're looking for across the board. Um, Black Hat SEO is the exact opposite. It goes against a lot of the guidelines or their questionable techniques. Um, so they're, they're widely accepted by the online marketing. Uh, they're not widely accepted by the online marketing community, and they can hurt your website. Uh, so you definitely want to be aware of these types of items that we're going to go over today um, are on your website or if your your web team have put these on. Um, there's also the chance that uh, when they did do the, these techniques that they were good at the time, but Google's constantly changing, so that could be a reason why they're now black hat techniques. Any questions or comments? Well, Robert, I'm actually monitoring the question and comment sections of this Google Hangout. And I don't see any coming in yet, but it gives me an opportunity to mention to folks that you are able to ask your comments and questions on the Google Hangout if you're logged in with a Google account. So I'll be taking a look at that throughout this. But I did want to comment on something that Robin just said, and that is uh, there are situations, and we even saw one in the last webinar, of somebody who had a black hat technique that was white hat at a time many years ago. And those types of things happen all the time. We see that from time to time where we'll get a website from a client that's pretty old, we'll take a look at it and we see some of the different specific black hat techniques that Robin is going to bring up uh, in, in the next section here. So Robin, why don't you give us a highlight on some of those different black hat techniques that we should be watching out for? Sure, here's uh, some we're going to go over today. So like cloaking, um, just every different kinds of spam, redirecting pages, so really just trying to mislead uh, the consumer or if you have some duplicate content or different kinds of code on your website things that are really just um, obviously bad for your website bad for the user experience um, things like link farms as well so a, a whole bunch of, of different ones that um, mostly would be done on purpose by uh, webmasters uh, to get ahead and to try to rank uh, quickly at, on the top page of Google or the number one position. Uh, but some can also be um, not on purpose and just, just bad techniques or maybe they, they just um, are not aware of the changes in, in Google. And they, you can have huge consequences on your site. Any questions? No questions yet from, from our viewers. However, I did want to comment on that as well. The one thing that you mentioned there, Robin, was the link farms, and that's something that maybe people aren't really aware of, but all these types of things that you've highlighted very briefly are usually things that are quick and easy techniques, and the really big takeaway that people should be having here is a black hat technique is usually a quick and easy shortcut to getting some short-term gain on SEO and as Google improves their algorithm over time they're looking at pre preventing those quick and easy techniques from actually working because they're looking at providing great results to you their customer in the search results there's nothing more irritating trying to search something and something that's not relevant shows up 
and that's what they're constantly tweaking their algorithm two times a day to do is to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So if you do come across some sort of quick and easy way to try and gain some rankings, be leery that it could be a black hat technique and it could hurt you in the long run and get your site or Google listing blacklisted. So with that, Robin, do you want to tell us a little bit about cloaking? Oh, sure. Uh, just just to be aware of some of these consequences, though, I mean, you can it can drop your rankings, it can uh, reduce your traffic. That'll be a big sign that you have a consequence from a black hat SEO technique. Maybe you don't even you're not even aware that they're on your website right now. Uh, if you haven't redone your website in a while, or if you have some uh, viruses on your website, that could be another uh, reason why your rankings tank. Um, but you can fall right off the local rankings. Um, you can get uh, redu you can reduce the site's ranking so you can go from page one to page five in just a day based on the algorithm or you can uh, get your whole site banned so definitely huge consequences. If uh, I could jump in there Robin just for a moment this morning at the Gaibo conference that we had I worked with a gentleman whose impressions and number of people coming to their site clearly dropped off significantly sometime uh, I, I would say two or three months ago in the insights that were in the Google My Business listing area and it's been low consistently so I said something happened back then that's really bad and that could have been a penalty of some sort that has hit him in some way so that's the sort of thing that you could look out for to know have I been hit with a penalty or not because they don't always come out and just tell you you all of a sudden see a drastic drop and usually a drastic drop in traffic means there could have been a drop in rankings or you just disappeared and that's how you can infer that a penalty has incurred. Yes, and if you want to know about penalties or if you have a penalty, we have a whole another blog on awesomedynamic.com all about recognizing your penalties and how to recover from them. Okay, so cloaking, uh, it's when you set up uh, two different versions of a website. So you have a version specifically made for search engines to uh, rank well and then for humans you have one uh, so that they can see a completely different page that has less keywords, it's more naturally written, maybe there's more pictures. Uh, so the one with the cloaked page could be you know keyword stuffing and you can. There's also programs. I mean, Google can easily distinguish if you're having two different versions of a web page. Um, and in saying that, there are some some reasons you would have a uh, white hat reasons why you would have two different versions. For example, targeted advertising. But most of the time, you're gonna have the exact same version for the human side and for search engines. And along with cloaking, also keyword stuffing is, is a black hat technique to avoid because it's just uh, an unnaturally writing in your website. For example, if your keyword is ice cream cones, uh, you could say, we have the best ice cream cones. Ice cream cones are great. Ice cream cones are what we sell and you need to buy an ice cream cone from us. Well, that's keyword stuffing because you just put it too, you put it too many times in there in an unnatural way but it's not necessarily on the front end of your website so if you go and check your website you might not see it because it might be in the back end in your meta tags in your picture alt tags it could be in the comments of your blog uh, it could be a hidden text so all that cloaked cloaked text uh, it could be somewhere in the body copy it could be anywhere on the website so you may not notice it by just reading the website so with that Robin taking a look at some of those different techniques we see that all the time especially in the keyword meta tag on pages maybe sometimes in the meta description for pages where someone will say we'll use ice cream for example ice cream parlor ice cream cone ice cream sandwiches ice cream this ice cream that and any version of ice cream frozen yogurt and they just string on and on and on anything that could possibly be related I've even seen that happening with towns that maybe a local business wants to get listed in. So they might put Libertyville, you know, ice cream in Libertyville, ice cream in Mundelein, ice cream in Vernon Hills, ice cream in Lincolnshire, ice cream in Lake Forest, ice cream in Lake Bluff, and it goes on and on and on and on. And there is no value to Google or to humans to do that. And that is essentially what Robin's calling keyword stuffing not just what Robin calls it, but that is what it's called. 
And that's something that even unnaturally putting that in the back end in some of those metadata spots is not good. Even in picture alt tags, which is listed here, that's essentially supposed to be a description of what the person is seeing in the pictures. And it was originally designed for blind people that used a screen reader that read them what was on the page and when it got to an image it would read the text that's in the image. Now many website designers today will just skip that and leave a blank. That's not good. But what we do want to do is describe what's in the picture and use the keyword one time. So if the keyword is ice cream cone, we'd say picture of a child eating an ice cream cone with a happy smile on his face. And that would describe the picture that's there. We use the keyword one time, but shoving a whole bunch of keywords into that alternative tag or alternative attribute in the image would not be a good white hat technique. So Robin, I'm going to give that back to you and we'll talk about uh, the next item here, please. Sure, and along with uh, those type of, type of tricky techniques, if you have really small font or if you have white background and white uh, text font on top of it that you can't see, right. that would be hidden hidden text. So you don't definitely don't want to do that. Um, if there's a space on your website, a lot of uh, people that are not familiar with SEO, if there's a space for keywords, it'll say keywords with an S. So people will try to put as many keywords as they can in there. You just want to stick with one per page so that Google's not confused. Uh, what is that page all about? And then it will rank better when people type it into search engines. How many keywords is that, Tim? How many per page? <laughs> Tim's got an audio issue. I put him on the spot, but that's okay. The answer is, Robin? It's just one, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that it has to be one word, it can be a keyword phrase. So ice cream cone is one keyword phrase. Very good. All right, uh, the next item here, Robin, is duplicate content. That's right. a great well, one. Yeah, doorway pages and redirecting pages. So okay. this, this is getting uh, really tricky when you put a, let's say it's kind of like when you're uh, fishing, I guess, on YouTube and you put up one uh, title slide of a video and then when you click on it, it's a completely different video. Same kind of thing with doorway pages um, and redirecting pages. Uh, so like doorway pages are the ones that they can be auto-generated by programs out there. They could be just pages that don't have a lot of content or they have duplicate content. So uh, just pages that are, are really bad pages that maybe they have keywords stuffed in them or maybe there there's a reason why it ranks it ranks really high on the search engine when you get there it's just a, a bad page with not a lot uh, of substance for humans and with the redirecting pages you, you'll click on one thing but it'll go to something else so it's just a really tricky uh, version and along with with these two kinds of pages, the doorway pages especially, you can get duplicate content on those pages or someone can copy your website. You definitely want original content on your page. And this isn't a mistake. I definitely made this uh, duplicate content, duplicate content. Is the I, I saw that and I really liked it too. And you know, duplicate content, a lot of people don't understand some of the stuff that they do to produce duplicate content. A couple things I want to give to folks as a resource is one of them is SiteLiner.com. It's a great place that you can go punch in your website, and it will tell you if there's any duplicate content on your website. And if so, where does it exist? Is it another copy on your own website, or is it another website somewhere else on the Internet that has the duplicate content? One thing that a lot of people make the mistake of doing is they'll get great reviews on, let's say, Yelp or Facebook or Google, and they'll copy those reviews and paste them onto their website. That's duplicate content. Basically, when duplicate content ex exists out on the internet, all the uh, if Google doesn't know what the original author of the content is, the sites that have them go down together. And we see this a lot of the time with franchise type organizations as well, that all the websites are controlled by the main franchise and they all say, oh, well, my corporation, my franchise gives me these blog posts that I can just post on my page. Well, if everybody in the organization is doing that same thing, they all have duplicate content together and they all suffer together. So really when you're talking about content, it's so important to make sure that you don't have the duplicate content, but also really focus on producing high quality, unique content that you produce originally. 
So tell us about code switching, Robin. Yes, this is a tricky, more advanced Black Hat SEO technique. Code switching is when you put some certain code in the back end of your website so you rank really high for that page. But then once you get all the traffic, it uh, switches the code in the back end to a human-friendly page. So basically you're trying to get up really high, rank well, and then the downside of it is that when the search engines uh, crawl the page again, it's going to go down once it sees the code is is not there. But in the meantime, you'll for maybe a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months before Google recrawls your page, you're going to be high up there in the search results. And Robin, I want to comment on that in regard to phone numbers that uh, that do switching. And the reason why I want to bring that up is we had a client that has a call tracking service with their pay-per-click company, and they have a phone number that they want. They wanted the phone number on the website to switch to a special number so they can track how many people have called. They can actually record the calls. They can record the time and date of the call and when it came in and when they viewed the website, what page they came from, and all this other stuff, which is really really neat and gives them a lot of data to provide to the client about return on investment. The only problem with that is there's a lot of controversy in the SEO community about using that code switching to produce a different number than what is real for the business. What is the business's real phone number, not what's the swapped out number to do some call tracking. And Mike Blumenthal's, who is a very, I would say an SEO elite in the local SEO space, has a whole very extensive article about why code switching for your phone number is really bad. And after reading it, I could tell you I would never use it because there are some SEO consequences, even though a lot of these companies will say, oh, there's no consequence with using this. I wouldn't trust them. Trust the experts in the SEO community that do organic SEO not necessarily the guys that are doing pay-per-click and they tell you to use that number. Now there are good places to use those special call tracking numbers and maybe those are in the pay-per-click ads themselves but not necessarily on your website or on your Facebook page or things like that because really from a local SEO standpoint having the right phone number matched to your real business number in all the different places is so very important. So Robin, tell us about avoiding bad neighborhoods. Yeah, if you think of your website as a house and you surround that house with all of these uh, other websites that are not great, so there's spam sites, adult content sites, even gambling sites, link farms, any sites that rank uh, really low online, so you have a score of 1 to 100 if you're, li if you're linking to all of these low ranking sites. Uh, that can affect your website. So you're basically guilty by association. So that's why when people say online, you know, we'll build 100 links for you or we'll, be, we'll build 500 links for you for $10, um, they're usually not very high quality links. And they'll build the links easily, but they won't help your site. They'll actually hurt your site. So even, even the other way, too, if you have a ton of low of spam and low-ranking sites linking to your page, that's also bad. So you want to try and combat that with good links and high quality content so that you, you get those naturally good links. Now Robin, based on that, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those deals that you see online. So sometimes there's the idea of three-way linking services where I link to company A, A company A links to company B, and B links back to me. So there's no reciprocal linking because essentially reciprocal linking doesn't provide any SEO value. The only time it's good to do reciprocal linking is if you're going to send traffic each way and there's a lot of it. But when you do that three-way linking, that's, that's one of these link farm techniques. Another one is there's people who specifically build a website only to post articles that backlink to websites. Backlinks to your website is very important and it is a huge ranking factor. The more of them and having a diverse portfolio of different types of backlinks is very important and that's how 
Google actually started is just the num the more backlinks you had from certain places, the more votes you had and the higher you would show up for certain terms. Well, it's changed significantly since Google started, but right now you really need to have the right balance of different types of links. Just like I like to compare it to investment strategy with your finances. So when you're doing any sort of financial investment, you want to invest in small companies and big companies in your stocks. You want to invest in stock options and bonds and regular savings accounts to diversify your risk. You want to invest in companies or stocks of overseas companies and ones that are local. You want to invest in real estate, gold, and stocks. So you're really just moving things around and having not all your eggs in one basket. And that's what a lot of financial professionals will tell you is a good investment strategy to diversify your portfolio is what they'll say. The same sort of strategy holds true to your backlink technique. You want to make sure that you have backlinks that are both no follow and follow. You want to have ones that have anchor text coming back, your brand, your website, your website with W's and without, with HTTPS, without HTTPS and all these other versions coming back to your website because that shows a very natural link flow. You want to make sure that you have a good amount of .coms, .edus, .govs, .bizs, .orgs. You want to make sure that you have a good amount of average or a good uh, uh, flow of links or diversification of links coming from different types of social media sites. So there's a lot of diversification in your link portfolio that you should really pay attention to. And Robin's going to show us a place where we can actually learn about those things, and that's what she's brought up on her screen here. Yeah, if you're a business owner and someone asks you, what does your backlink profile look like? That's definitely a basic website vital that you should know. So you can go to, if you don't know, go to ahrefs.com or one of their competitors as well, and you can just type in your website here and they'll let you know. Um, it is a paid version, though. Right. But very, very good information. Now, speaking of very, very good information, that leads me right into the end of your article here, Robin, which is reporting your competitors and some great resources. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so if you're doing all this hard work on your website, you're doing everything right, you're doing all the white hat SEO techniques, and you see that your competitors are ahead of you and they're using all of these bad black hat SEO techniques that we're telling you not to use, but they're still ranking ahead of you. Well, you can definitely do something about it. Uh, first, you can go here to see what the guidelines are. Um, and then you can see this article it tells you how to get rid of them. You can also put, um, you can submit to Google here as well, uh, a specific site. Uh, you can go to Google Groups and put a thread here, and that'll raise the attention to to the actual Google Teams. And then here's a great article as well that you can get rid of your uh, competition that's using the, the black hat techniques and, and really put a red flag on their website. Great, Robin. That's fantastic. So, Robin, can you help me out and go to the home page of AwesomeDynamic.com? Sure. Because the one thing we're going to ask folks who are watching this video or live webinar at this point is if you found this information really valuable, you can, of course, contact us. We'd love to work with you. But we want to really quick highlight the different things that we do. So this way you folks know we do responsive web design, create websites that are mobile friendly. We do search engine optimization. That's really a big piece of what we just talked about, the search engines uh, optimization where we can do full service for you or we can consult with you and teach you how to do a lot of things on your own. We also have Amazon Seller Consulting and we actually did SEO on ourselves and we just hit a number one ranking for Amazon Seller Consulting nationally today which is very exciting for us and we get lots of leads and people calling us uh, from all over the country and even outside the country on a daily basis for that Amazon Seller Consulting service as a result of our SEO services promoting it online. And then we also do Google Virtual Tours, which is basically the Google Street View, but inside your business and connected to Google Maps and your Google My Business listing in the correct way. So if you found this webinar and this segment very helpful, we'd ask you to go down to the bottom of the home page of our website, which will bring you to our Review Us button. And Robin, if you zoom on down there, 
If you click this Review Us button, we got a pretty clever thing that we just implemented on our website, which we've done for a lot of our clients. Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? Well, you are going to click thumbs up and give us a five-star review. So click on the thumbs up, Robin. And we would like a five-star on Google, on our Google My Business page, if you wouldn't mind. And that will bring you right to the right place where you can leave us that Google review after you log into your Google account, or if you'd like to leave us a five star on our Facebook page, we would appreciate that as well. There it is, five stars. These guys are awesome. Really helped me out understanding what black te hat techniques I should avoid. Thank you so much, Robin and Paul. That's what I would write if I were you. All right. So that being said, we have a whole segment prepared for you about Amazon Seller Consulting and specifically a topic pertaining to how do I label my products and send them in to FBA. And this is where Blake is going to go ahead and change the screen over to Tim's at this point. And Tim and I are going to talk about FBA labeling in general. So Tim, are you ready to get started with this? Yes, I am. All right, so why don't you lead us off then? All right, FBA labeling. Um, and I click it and it doesn't go. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right, well, first let's just talk a little bit uh, about the general idea of um, why Amazon requires labels for their products. Um, the first thing is, uh, in general, Amazon needs to be able to identify each individual product and they can either do that using Amazon's labeled inventory, uh, using their uh, item numbers called uh, FN SKUs is what they're called, or uh, for some products you can actually do and use the manufacturer's barcode to be able to send an inventory. There are certainly pros and cons to both. Uh, I don't know if we necessarily want to go into that right now, but that's something that we certainly would... Uh, uh, want to decide when we want to add products into uh, Amazon. Well, Tim, why don't we talk about which version we recommend? Sure. We recommend doing stickered inventory. And the biggest reason for that is that if you were to do stickerless inventory, as you see, it's called commingled. So that means that if you sell on a listing with several other sellers on there, the inventory can actually get commingled, which means that let's say if one of the sellers decides to send in a product without any packaging. Uh, that's not allowed by Amazon, but let's say if one of your buyers buy a product from you, uh, they might be sent one of your competitor's products because Amazon thinks that they're the same. By labeling your inventory with uh, Amazon stickers, you actually will be able to make sure that when someone buys a product from you, they are actually getting a product that you had sent into Amazon. I want to bring up an example of this, Tim. We talked about with one of our clients recently about how well, why, why is this so very important. And you, you essentially explained it very, very succinctly. But I want to give an example to, to really show how this can be a problem. So here's a scenario. Let's say I buy a purse. On Amazon, I'm not. Maybe I'm buying that purse for my wife on Amazon, and I buy that purse and I get that purse in and I wrap it up and I give it to my wife and she's like, I don't like this thing at all. This is not what I asked for. Return it. So I can choose to return it to Amazon and they probably take it back and maybe I'll pay a restocking fee. Maybe they'll just take it back for free, which they've been doing a lot of. Or what I could do is I could choose as just a customer to take that, put it back in the box, and list it as a brand new item against the same page that I bought it from as a seller, as Paul DeWarian the seller, on this listing that was created by whoever created the page before. And maybe between when she said I didn't like it and I said I don't want to return, I'm going to list it new, let's say there's a couple pieces missing from it because maybe it sat around on a table for a little while, it missed the return period, and it's kind of messed up, but... You know, or maybe there's some piece missing, but no one's going to know according to me, and I, that's what I think. I could package it back up, list it as new, and send it in, and one of your customers could get the bag that I sent in as new, and they might be upset and leave a negative review on that listing. And 
the reason is if because if it was commingled inventory, all those bags coming in from anybody, you know, Paul DeWarian sends this one in with the missing piece, you're the manufacturer, you send in a whole bunch of pieces that are perfect, but if you do commingle, they all go into the same bucket. And when Amazon gets an order, they take one out of the bucket, no matter who it came from, and they ship it out to that customer that ordered it. So by doing the stickered inventory, you protect yourself and your customers from getting a unit that is not somebody else's. It's yours. So the ones that you sticker and send in are going to be your, you know with confidence that your customers are going to get exactly those items. Tim, do you have any comments on that? No, I think that's an excellent example that really helps illustrate why it's so important to do the stickered inventory. So, Tim, I don't know if your next bulletin on here is whether or not you can have Amazon do it for you or if you do it yourself, but I'd be, there we go. <laughs> go ahead yep. and move right into it. Yeah, so a lot of people think it's an absolute pain in the butt to take all their inventory, print out all these labels, which we're going to get more in-depth into what's involved with printing the labels, uh, and then putting them on, sending them out to Amazon, especially if you get everything case-packed from the customer, or, or I'm sorry, from your supplier. But Amazon does allow you to basically use a labeling service called the FBA Labeling Service, where you can pay, I believe it's 20 cents per unit, and Amazon will apply the labels for you automatically when while they're receiving the shipment at their fulfillment centers. So that's uh, that's really a huge advantage. That sounds awfully convenient, especially for somebody that doesn't want to take all their items out of the box or, or deal with that at their warehouse. So if they just don't have the personnel or folks on staff to do that themselves, or they're sending in thousands of units, or they're even having their units sent to Amazon and they never touch them, that the Amazon labeling service certainly can be worth that 20 cents a piece. But going mm -hmm. back to applying the labels yourself, I remember how we started because I, I have a separate Amazon business. And when we started, we had the 30 up labels, the Avery 30 up labels. And, we and we're going to talk more about that, by the way. Okay, so we're going to get into that. Detail. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Okay. But uh, just to kind of go back to this, um, there is an unplanned service fee. So if you, let's say, send an inventory, forget to label it, and don't ask Amazon beforehand to label it, they're going to charge you to label all your products. Sometimes that's a higher fee than just the 20 cents per unit. And if you do that too often, it can actually restrict your ability to be able to use the FBA program or even could possibly affect your seller account in, uh, in general. Okay. Yeah, so all right, so let... That, that uh, not only applies to labeling, but it's just if you send in the wrong number of units right. or you send them to the wrong places, yeah. It, not only do you get some fees, but if you keep doing it and you really don't have tight quality control over what you're doing, Amazon can penalize your account to the point of shutting it down. Yeah, they didn't become the n number one retailer on Amazon or what, number one retailer, trusted retailer on the Internet by allowing people to really mess up things and, and not do a great job of being high quality customer service and performers in general in servicing uh, customers and sending an in inventory, et cetera. Excellent. All right, well, if we don't have any questions, we can move on to the next part, which is how to actually print those labels. All right, let's get into it. All right, printing Amazon labels. Uh, the way that most sellers start out which is a great way to start, is by using a laser printer. And I put a laser printer in here specifically because, uh, and I'll again reiterate this at the end of this slide, you do not want to print labels using an inkjet printer. And the big reason is because, uh, I'm sorry, we'll get into that in a second, but uh, when you print labels onto a laser, or using a label printer, you use what are called 30 up labels, which is just using the standard Avery 5160 or 8160 labels, which are just 30 ad, uh, return address labels. You can find them anywhere. We usually recommend using the actual Avery brand because they tend to stick a lot better to the products than some of the um, private label branded ones or uh, unlabeled or unbranded versions. So it's important to get good labels. This way they stay on your products. Um, then what you do is you basically get a PDF of your labels generated by Amazon. 
and uh, or so you can either get the labels while you're creating a shipment through the Amazon system, or what we usually recommend is that you actually print the item labels from your inventory screen where you can actually print a full page of 30 labels at a time. The problem with printing labels this way is let's say I'm only sending in 20 items and I want to just print 20 labels. Well, it'll print up 20 labels onto a PDF, but we have 10 labels that we can't use anymore. So we might be able to flip it around and print 10 more on there, but it just becomes a major hassle to have to constantly go back and print partial pages and it, it, it just really is quite an annoyance trying to print these things out, especially as you start doing volume and have several different SKUs that you're dealing with. So, I want to comment on that, Tim, if I mm -hmm. could. When you're printing from the Amazon interface and you say I have 10 of these or 20 of these, they don't give you the choice of which labels on the page you could do like you can in Microsoft Word. Correct. It's basically going to just lump them all to one side or at the top and whatever is on the page is where it's gonna where it's going to end up. So that's why we recommend just do a full thirty. Even if you only need, let's say, five now and you think your product might take off and you only need five next week, print up the page of thirty. What I used to do is put them in manila folders in a file cabinet and they'd label it. Yeah, this is the unit that I that these labels are for. And I'd have all those in my file cabinet and when I was ready to send any other units in, I pull out the sheet of labels and I just peel off whatever I needed and put them on there. Now, Tim, the other thing about the laser printer that I think you, I don't recall if you mentioned, but it also prevents the smearing of the ink on right. there because it is adhering right onto the label and, and it prevents Correct. that smearing. And, and why is that important? I, it's important because uh, your labels have to be able to survive at least 24 months. And I think this is actually on the last slide as uh, some information is your label on your product needs to be legible and readable by barcode scanners for 24 months after you send an inventory to them. And the problem with uh, ink is it can smear, it can uh, it gets damaged by uh, being wet, uh, it's just not going to be able to survive as long as it needs to. The laser is able to last quite a bit longer but um, the best option is using a thermal laser laser printer, a label printer. I don't know why I said laser, but it's a thermal label printer. There are many different types of label printers out there, and probably the um, biggest thing is, uh, and I'm going to get to this in a second, the biggest thing is that you're able to basically print on demand. Um, the way that you print out labels using a label printer is either you can use let's a lot of a lot of companies now they have software that can actually print out the labels for them, but Amazon does actually generate uh, the labels for you in a, a label printer friendly format, uh, and that's by going into the shipping queue and then selecting the option scan and label at the top. And as I said before that provides you on-demand printing. So let's say we're sending in five products of SKU A, 10 of SKU B, and seven of SKU C. Um, I can actually just go in, print five of the first one, print ten of the second one, print uh, seven of the third one, and I can just stick them right onto my packages right away. Don't have to worry about wasting any extra labels because of all that wasted space. Don't have to worry about filing anything so that I have the go back and find the you know rest of the 30 labels in the products or in the uh, for, for the ones that you want to send in later so it just becomes a lot more efficient process by doing the thermal laser printer option and speaking of that process Tim it also adds another level of being able to check did I get everything for this particular right. case that I'm going to be sending into the warehouse which is something you don't get with the first option so you can have the labels you can print out the labels in a way where the strip of labels is for five of these, three of these, two of those, 27 of these, etc. And all those particular products are going to go in one box to the warehouse in Phoenix. And let's say you do another strip of labels for the products that Amazon wants you to send over to Pennsylvania. So this allows you to be able to 
use those strips of labels as a check to make sure you got all the right things in the box as you're labeling them and putting them into the box, which is a great way to add some extra quality assurance to your Amazon shipping process. So I Tim, let's to, go ahead, oh, Tim. I wanted to add a couple notes. Uh, the uh, laser printer, something along the lines of what Tim had said about laser printing being almost un smearable. We thought the same thing too for a long time. My brother and I also run a small Amazon account where we business where we have a pro seller account and we happened to buy a third party uh, toner cartridge for our laser printer and found out mm -hmm. the quality was so low that these labels were actually uh, smearing again with an actual laser printer which was crazy to us. Right. And uh, so encouraging people similar to the Avery experience to actually buy the it's going to pay off in the long run to buy the actual quality product between labels and toner uh, for your business and second thing along that line is we are still my brother and I in the laser printer slash 30 up labels phase but we have realized lately that the thermal label printing system is the much more efficient and well-oiled machine way and we will soon be transitioning into that and we're excited about that. Yeah, and so. just to kind of piggyback on your comment there, Blake, yeah, if you have a brother laser printer, get brother toners. If you print labels, make sure you use the Avery labels. That will help make sure that your labels are able to uh, withstand the shipping process and will remain scannable for those two years that are required. But yeah, if, if, anything, if anything else, just make sure you do not use inkjet printers. That's right. So no, wow, that's really big there, Tim. Yeah. And Tim, that's one of the things I just wrote down here. This is the Zebra printer, uh, or it yes. looks very similar to the one that we use. Can you Do you have the model number that you can pull up? Yeah, it's uh, 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 Z, uh, sorry, give me a second. Oh, <laughs> I go had ahead. enough just a second ago. It's the... Um, Zebra 2844. Uh, they sometimes have other letters and stuff uh, before or after it, just because of some of the attachments that they have, whether they're made to have like a cutoff thing. But if you just get a generic 2844 Zebra printer, which we've been able to find used ones on eBay for probably about $170, $180 that work beautifully. So, and One thing that we've done also is we have two. So if yep. you think about it, you start ramping up volume in your business. We we did 200,000 last year. We want to do more this year. And we're shipping out products uh, almost on a daily basis out of our office and warehouse here. And if we have the laser or the laser printer go down or the zebra printer go down, that's going to delay the amount of time it takes to get our product into the warehouse and that's not acceptable to me because if the inventory sitting in our warehouse it's not making us any money it's not available for sale so having extra of the equipment available to be able to just swap out at a moment's notice extra toners extra laser printers for the we can I wanted to bring that up too we still use the laser printer for our UPS labels and mm -hmm. for anything that we do for the pallet size shipping and things like that, those are th that's critical to have those extra pieces of equipment. It doesn't cost a lot of extra money to have that safety net of being able to just swap out and use a different printer. So this way you can keep your process going without any sort of delay based on some sort of equipment failure. That being said, Tim, let's talk about what we use for the... Yeah, these are labels for the Amazon products themselves, but yeah. since we are labeling them and we're shipping things in, we might as well bring up the idea of shipping things in through uh, UPS. So if we're doing UPS right. shipping, th there's, there's different things that we can do to make that process more efficient, and that's where you could even use another Zebra printer, or you can do the two-up labels per sheet on the laser printer. So can you get into some of that detail as well? Sure, I don't really have anything in the presentation to kind of to walk through this, but uh, in general, Amazon allows you to use their partnered shipping. What that means is instead of going directly to UPS to be able to ship products in, you'll actually use Amazon to ship via UPS to their fulfillment centers, and it's at a very steep discount. 
So that was something important that I wanted to make sure I kind of bring up before going into this a little bit more in depth. But that means that you get sometimes up to 60 to 70% off of retail prices of UPS uh, shipments. Now, when you create the labels in Amazon, what it will do is it will generate the UPS shipping labels, uh, and these are what need to be stuck on the outside of each uh, box that needs to be shipped into Amazon. Each of these shipping labels actually has two labels on it. The label on the left will have the actual UPS label that UPS uses to track it and ship it to you or to the fulfillment center. And then the label on the right is the FBA label. The FBA label contains information for Amazon to be able to easily check in and uh, process your shipment when it arrives at their fulfillment center. And it's extremely important to that when you apply those to the box that they do not cover any seams and they do not go over any edges. When you print these out, they come out on a full 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. And when you when you print them out, you can just print them out on plain paper, but then you have to tape over it, uh, it to be able to make sure it doesn't get damaged in shipping or you know affected by any kind of rain or weather, anything like that. What we have found is that UPS actually provides what are called two-up labels. So we talked about 30-up labels before. But UPS will provide you for free uh, two-up UPS labels that is will fit these label sheets perfectly. All you have to do, load up your printer, print off the Amazon labels for the shipping, and peel them off, stick them right onto the boxes, drop it off at UPS. It is so efficient, it is so fast, and because it's printed out on the laser, again, using good th uh, toners and you're using the good quality UPS shipping labels, it, it, it uh, survives the whole way through. We've never had an issue with them. Yeah, that, that's a really neat pro tip, and all you need is your own UPS account. You can open that for free, and you're allowed mm -hmm. to order a certain amount of material at no cost from UPS, and they'll just ship it to you. And they'll, they'll do the two-up labels that go through the laser printer, and they even have rolls of labels that you can put in one of these Zebra printers as well. Right. Those aren't compatible with uh, Amazon's FBA shipping process, but if you process shipments... Outside of uh, Amazon, you know, fulfill orders yourself instead of using Amazon's fulfillment service. Uh, that's what we do for a few products that can't be shipped into FBA. That's a very valuable thing to have. So we actually do have three uh, label printers. They're, they're all the same, just uh, two different size labels. Gotcha. Well, let's take a look at the last slide here, Tim. All right. And, and this is all about, you know, the requirements for the barcode itself. All right, so what, what do we need to know? So the first thing is that uh, you have to make sure that when you are putting the label onto the package that you make sure you cover all existing barcodes. That includes a UPC code. That includes any other crazy UPC or, uh, barcodes that they may put on there. Some packages have multiple barcodes on them. You have to make sure that they are completely covered up, and the only scannable barcode that is on there is Amazon's FN SKU barcode. So that's where sometimes if you have too many barcodes on there, instead of sticking a whole bunch of white labels all over the place to cover them up, it might make sense to use a, a bag, a poly bag that covers it up or put it into a box and then label the box or something like that, depending on what's going to be the most efficient method. And one thing that I know some manufacturers do is for product that is designated for Amazon, they actually have the Amazon barcode printed on the box as opposed to the actual uh, UPC code, which uh, if you have the ability to do that, that can cut down on your prep time quite a bit. And yeah, costs. absolutely. What's our next item, Tim? So we kind of covered this before, minimum 24 months, so that means that when you create barcodes, they have to make sure to survive at least 24 months. Um, each, uh, each SKU requires its own barcode. So what that means is just like how if you have a UPC for your different products, it's one UPC per variation of a product. When you create the listings in Amazon, it's going to create a unique FN SKU for each product that you sell. So it's extremely important to make sure that everything gets matched up correctly whenever you 
uh, create these labels and stick them on the products. So that means if uh, that purse that I was talking about before, if there's a pink one, a blue one, a purple one, and some of them have two handles, some of them have one handle, every single variation, the purple one with the one handle needs its own FN SKU. The pink one with the two handles needs its own, the et cetera, and so forth. So you have to make sure that every variation has its own unique barcode. Is that correct, Tim? Yes, that's correct. Uh, this is pretty self-explanatory, but you want to make sure you place it on the outside of all the prep material, all the packaging. So that means that if you have put your product into a poly bag, put that label onto the outside of the poly bag. If you put it inside of a brown box, make sure that that label is on the outside of the brown box. It needs to be something where Amazon is able to easily pick up the product from one of their in one of their shelves, scan it, and send it in right away. So basically ship it out right away. Um, also, you have to make sure that it's placed on a flat surface. Again, the same thing. Amazon needs to be able to scan it uh, without any difficulty. And, and, it, and part of the same thing with that is that it needs to be at least a quarter inch between the edge of the label and the edge of the item. So it can't go over any edges. It can't uh, go on any, uh, you know, extremely rounded areas. I know that there's some packaging that is kind of uh, rounded or spherical in nature. Uh, you really need to make sure that you put it onto a surface that's able to e be easily found, A, and B has to be able to be easily scanned. And lastly, kind of going back to making sure everything is labeled, it is extremely important that if you have a case-packed product and you are labeling the products yourself, you need to label each individual item that's inside of that case and make sure all of those barcodes that are existing on those products are covered as well. So if any of this sounds daunting to you, that's where the labeling service can take care of a lot of these things for you. But you're paying the 20 cents a unit to do that. Right. Okay. So these are a lot of really specific items about labeling all of your items that are going to Amazon and even the boxes that you're using to send them into Amazon uh, through uh, the FBA system. Uh, another pro tip that I wanted to bring up is if you're using boxes that already have labels on them, so say you're, you're just starting out, so we, we work with corporations that are huge that are just buying boxes by the pallet load and they're putting all their stuff in there, or maybe they're just doing palletized shipping and sending them in. But we also work with companies that have an invention and they're just trying to start out and they're using the materials that they have at hand. And sometimes if you had a box that came in from Amazon, something you ordered, you might want to use a, a heat gun to basically heat up the label just a little bit on something that maybe came in. You could just peel off that label very easily, and then you're able to uh, slap your own label in it, or you can cover it up or, or whatever. But there's there's a something that we've done when we first started was heating up the label and peeling them off. So I thought that was something that might be valuable. Absolutely. So I think the other thing that we could really get into at some point in time, and maybe our next webinar on Amazon could be about how to package things the right way, you know, talk about the drop testing and some of those other things, which we can certainly link from this video as well when we get that onto our webpage and uh, onto YouTube. So we'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this particular, this particular webinar. Uh, we do have a special guest that we're going to bring, and Tim, can you... Uh, mention that particular guest that we're going to have on our next week's webinar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, his name is uh, Ted Limus. Uh, he is an attorney based out of California who a few years ago, or I think it was a, couple, a few years ago, he found one of his clients was having a lot of trouble with uh, being able to um, protect their product and their brand on Amazon. And I just pulled up their website right or his website right here. And you can see he's basically dedicated his entire law firm towards protecting your Amazon, protecting your Amazon listings. Uh, if you ever have your account suspended for one reason or another, which, you know, many people, sometimes you just make one small mistake that causes your account to be suspended or um, have your payments uh, withheld for a short period of time. He can help you with your appeals and uh, help you with, if you're the manufacturer of a product, enforce any kind of map policies to make sure all of your... Um, all of your buyers are actually following 
your pricing structure and are not selling where, where they should not be selling. So he has a lot of valuable information, and uh, he agreed to be our guest next week. So I'm really excited to hear what he's going to uh, say. And we're, we're still in the process of trying to figure out what we're specifically going to talk about, but I think it's going to be a great discussion. Absolutely. And Tim, would you mind bringing up the Amazon page and our website real quick? Just want to sure. cover the specific things that we do. And I'll let Terry, since he's rejoined us, just run through some of the different Amazon options that we have. So any viewers of this YouTube video after it's finished can learn a little bit more about what we offer. So Terry, why don't you take it away there? All right. Well, thank you, Paul. So uh, yeah, as far as our Amazon consulting goes, we have a program where we can set up your account for you, get it all ready to go, do all the photography, contents, et cetera, et cetera, and turn over the keys to you and let you run with it. We have a program where we can completely manage that account, set it up, get it started, and run it from start to finish, where basically you're just shipping product when we tell you it needs to be shipped and where to ship it, and we take care of everything else that's involved, uh, take care of the whole process for you. And lastly, we have an on-demand consulting situation where you buy a block of hours from us and then we can help you with any kind of issues that come up. Uh, any part of the things we just talked about could be part of the things we help you either learn how to do or we take care of them for you within those hours with no monthly commitment. So that's a quick rundown on some of the ways we can help and we're helping companies of all sizes from little new startups to some you know really big organizations that are needing our help with Amazon. Great. And what's the best way for folks to contact us, Terry, if they want to help, uh, want help really with any of these things? Sure. Reach out directly to me at 847-665-9497. We also have our 800 number on the website. You can use that as well. And uh, you can email me at terry at awesomedynamic.com. Great. Thank you, Terry. So we're going to wrap up the webinar for today. we got two minutes left. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we're also going to be putting up a blog post about this particular portion of talking about labeling, and Robin's going to help us put that together. So you'll be able to expect it on our website. Upcoming events, Terry, do you want to tell us what's coming up? Sure. We have next week on the 27th, if you're local, we do have a review party, and that is in Deerfield at the Rogers Law Group. And then our next one will be at the end of August, and that one will be at, in Lake Bluff. And those are now on the, I believe they're now on the website, are they not? Yes, they are. So we All do right. have a section of the website that talks about our upcoming live events. All right, so you can check them there. And uh, you can, again, always reach out to me at the information I gave you previously, and we'll take care of that, get you set up as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you next week at 1230 Central Time. Bye-bye now.